There we go. Okay, well, welcome to the second of the PowerPoint recordings for uh, Moral Dimensions of Public Policy, PUAF 650. <clears throat> Hopefully this one will go a little bit smoother than the last one. We'll see. I've been listening to Dessa and getting pumped up to talk to you about liberal egalitarianism, which, by the way, if you, if you are not... Uh, well, actually, after the last class, what I should say is the first thing you should do with your money is go out and donate it to the poor. That's what the utilitarians will tell you. If you don't do that, though, you should definitely go out and buy Dessa's album and then listen to it. But in the meanwhile, let's talk about liberal egalitarianism. Liberal egalitarianism is uh, actually the first of two related theories that we're going to talk about that fall under the general category of liberalism. And in addition today to talking about the liberal egalitarianism, we're also going to talk a little bit about feminist and other uh, critical challenges to this. It's a little bit of an awkward kludge, but there's almost no way to make it a not awkward kludge. Uh, initially, I had followed the awkward kludge in Kimlicka of leaving feminism to its own thing all the way at the end of the class. Um, but this runs into the same problem that, that Kimlicka points out, which is that there's sort of... Um, feminism is almost a kind of parallel political philosophy in that there are feminist strands of a lot of the things that we're going to talk about. And to some extent, the ones that are not kind of liberal feminism or libertarian feminism or feminist theory of ecology, it's a criticism of the entire project uh, that liberal egalitarianism shares with many other theories. So at the very least, talking about it up front here lets you get a sense of it uh, that you can keep in the back of your mind, either because you think it's wonderful or because you think it's crazy as we go on. The other little uh, note that I just want to give you about setup at the beginning is that uh, Feminism, what I'm using it here for, and I think to some extent the way Kimlicka uses it, is a little bit of a stand-in for a broad range of critical political philosophies. So a lot of the structure of feminism is shared with things like critical race theories, um, especially many of the more left-wing critiques of kind of mainstream political philosophy. So if you're interested in that, we'll get to it. If, on the other hand, you're interested in the right-wing critiques of mainstream political philosophy, you're in luck. Next week, we will be talking about libertarianism, and then later we'll talk about communitarianism, uh, which one of the guises of communitarianism is what we often call social conservatism here in the U.S. So you will get your chance, I promise. <clears throat> Pardon me. But for now, let me take a sip of my coffee. Ah. Uh, and let's talk about liberal egalitarianism. All right, before we get into liberal egalitarianism, I lied, before we get into liberal egalitarianism, let's talk about liberalism. Now, the first thing to keep in mind, just because I'm teaching this class in the United States, is that when I use the term liberalism, I think of this with a small l. <clears throat> this is not uh, what we mean in the US when we talk about someone being a liberal which usually means that, uh, it usually means they are liberal, but it usually refers specifically to a kind of center-left version of liberalism. Commitment to redistributive taxation, relatively large government, uh, skepticism of military, that sort of thing. Liberalism as a political theory, as a strand in political theory, is broader than that. And in particular, uh, small-l liberalism. I'm going to drop the small-l from now on. Here it is, small l liberalism for the rest of the time. Liberalism in this sense encompasses more or less all of the mainstream of political discourse in the US and almost all of it in a place like Europe. Uh, in particular, the, the, main, the main line of both the Democratic and Republican uh, parties hold to basically liberal tenets. All right, so what are these liberal tenets? The first one, and the one that's actually not on the slide because this is sort of more about where it sits within moral theory than political theory, is that if you remember last week I talked about these three great families of moral theories, deontological theory, uh, consequentialist theory, and virtue theory. Utilitarianism is a form of consequentialist theory, focuses on consequences. Liberal theories, at least typical ones, are 
deontological theories. They want to redeem the intuition that many people have, that probably most people have, that there are at least some absolute rules, at least some things that you simply do or do not do regardless of the consequences of the actions, or at least almost regardless of the consequences of the actions. Some, some deontologists allow for a kind of disaster exception to these things, but basically that's the idea. All right. The key ideas for liberalism, though, are really two that are universal, that are kind of determining of the fact that you have a liberal theory versus some other kind of theory, and two that are very often associated with liberal theories. So the first is liberal theories are individualist. They don't necessarily, this does not necessarily mean that they don't care about social relationships. And it certainly doesn't mean that liberals take as a moral ideal a kind of rugged individualism or separation from people, right? So they're not, they're not Nietzsche, they're not Ayn Rand, necessarily. Ayn Rand was a liberal, but of a very particular kind. Um, what I mean by saying that liberal theories are individualist is what's sometimes referred to as methodological individualism. And all this means is that the core moral perspective of liberalism is a focus on the individual human being. What matters to a liberal moral or a liberal, liberal political theory is what the effects are on the interests, the projects, the concerns, the freedom of individual human beings. Everything ultimately has to come back to that. Um, so for instance, on the one hand, this means a kind of structural opposition to the aggregation that, that utilitarians do. Remember, one of the complaints about utilitarianism was that, <clears throat> pardon me, one of the complaints about utilitarianism was that it privileges utility over the individual who is a bearer of that utility. For utilitarianism, it's of no moral import to slosh utility around between people. If you can harm me to help someone a little bit more than the harm, that's fine. Liberals very much resist that kind of perspective. Everything comes down to do you respect, do you promote the interests of individuals. They also resist a perspective that we're going to come to a bit more later, so I won't talk about very much here, which is a communitarian perspective. For communitarians, groups have independent moral standing. Liberals can care about groups, right? They can care about families or nations or ethnic groups or churches or any kind of group that you like. But ultimately, the only reason they care about those groups is because those groups are important to individuals. So for a traditional liberal, uh, the nation might be important, but only insofar as having the nation is good for the individual involved. There's no independent moral standing of the nation. If we talk about sacrifice for the nation, this ultimately has to come back to sacrifice for other people. Okay, we'll talk about that more later though. The other thing that's characteristic of liberal theories is that as part of the focus on individuals, a moral politics has to respect human freedom. Individuals on liberal theories are characterized by being free. And the great sin for a liberal political theory is unjustifiably interfering with the freedom of individuals. Okay. Now, two things that are characteristic of liberalism, but not really universal. The first is that most liberals focus on some version of, of, of rule of law as a political ideal. Most liberal theories look to the creation of promulgated, democratically decided upon, clear, public, um, equally applicable laws as an important um, expression of their notion of equality. In a sense, where the utilitarians understand equality in terms of the equal counting of everyone's interests, the equal counting of everyone's utility, the liberals understand equality in the sense of moral equality between people and before the institutions of the state. Uh, so for the liberals, 
having a set of laws that treats everyone equally, that takes no notice of your social standing, whether you have royal blood, whether you are black, white, in between national, not national, indigenous, non-indigenous, uh, male, female, follower of whatever religion, a system of laws that <clears throat> takes no notice of the those kinds of differences between people is part of the liberal ideal. The other part of this is very many liberal theories, uh, almost all of them that I can think of, try to reconcile the respect for individual freedom with the need for potentially coercive state institutions through some idea about a social contract. Um, the idea being that you can coerce free individuals if in some sense they have agreed in advance to that coercion. We'll talk about this a bit more, uh, and this is of course the kind of idea that gives anarchists heartburn. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about anarchists in this class, though I am, I am happy to talk about them with you if you are interested otherwise. But the way that liberals, even though they focus on freedom, the way that liberals avoid being anarchists is very typically through some version of social contract theory. Okay. So what about liberal egalitarianism? What identifies this specific strand of liberalism? The first is liberal egalitarianism, and this is not something that only liberal egalitarians believe, but it's important to um, their strand of it. Liberal egalitarians believe that uh, they, they, as a political matter, we should not have any substantive theory of the good life. <clears throat> this phrasing is largely from Rawls, one of the big defenders of liberal egalitarians, and it sounds a little bit technical, but really what it amounts to is that the state, the polity, the community, should not privilege any particular kind of life over any other. The state should be involved with making sure everyone gets a fair shot for some value of fairness at living whatever kind of life they want. But as a result of the individualism of the theory, the idea is that what the state should not do is tell you what kind of life is a good one. So it might incidentally promote certain kinds of lives by, for instance, uh, having taxation that prevents you from becoming extremely wealthy, or by requiring that you have a job if you want to get income, uh, those sorts of things. But the state should not be involved in telling you, say, at the end of the day, once you've done your job, you've fulfilled your commitments to the taxation, the state should not be involved in things like telling you what religion you ought to follow or whether you ought to sit on your couch and play video games or craft great works of art, or whether you ought to go spend your money on going out to the opera or spend your money on going out to uh, pro wrestling matches. Are pro wrestling matches still a thing? Am I just old? Anyway. The second part is that egalitarians, and this is more specific to egalitarians, they start from a presumption of equality. The liberal egalitarians, starting from the idea of equality that's built into liberalism, liberal egalitarians basically say, okay, if it is a presumption of liberalism that everyone is morally equal, then other things being equal, everyone ought to get an equal share of social resources in addition to being uh, fairly treated by the law and that sort of thing. Now, this doesn't mean that they, ought, they believe that automatically at the end of the day, everyone should have equality of outcomes and equal share of social resources. It just means that the default assumption is that everyone should get an equal share of whatever resources there are in society, of the money, of the food, of the land, of whatever. Any deviation from equality has to be justified. So the liberal egalitarian point is just that the default position should be that everyone gets the same. And you need an argument to explain why anyone should get something different. 
Uh, they differ from from a number of theorists on this, uh, not only from the libertarians who we'll talk about again next week, but uh, there are some theorists who've had very deflationary views of the polity. Um, Hume, this is a little bit of a caricature of Hume, but not terribly. David Hume, for instance, just thought, no, I mean, you know, everybody gets what they have. And by default, everyone should sort of assume that they deserve whatever they've got, unless you can give a special reason why this is undeserved. For the liberal egalitarians, you start from the assumption that if you cannot justify an inequality, then you should have equal distribution. Uh, this is actually a little side issue that, that keep in mind. A lot of what we're going to talk about is what's called distributive justice, which is specifically about how do we spread around the resources that society has. So that's your SAT word for the, for the day. Okay. Liberal egalitarians also tend to idealize systems that are ambition sensitive, but endowment insensitive. Again, this is a little bit jargony. As far as I know, this jargon comes from Kimlicka, but it's a pretty good way of capturing what they're interested in. To say that the system is ambition sensitive means that the amount of resources that people end up with at the end of the day should be keyed in some way to how much effort they put in. So, you know, this is not terribly surprising. The ideal is basically just that if you work harder, you should get more. And possibly if you work smarter, you should, you should get more. If you figure out a better way of doing something, um, that should be compensated. But on the other hand, liberal egalitarians usually idealize a system that is endowment insensitive. So, first of all, this covers all of the obvious kinds of non-discrimination that liberal egalitarians and most liberals want there to be. So, the fact that you were born with darker or lighter skin should not matter. Uh, to how many resources you end up with at the end of the day. The fact that you were born male or female or intersexed or whatever should not matter to how much resources you get at the end of the day. But in addition, uh, liberal egalitarians usually want to compensate further and they want to equalize further because they want to say, look, if you think that it is meaningless what color of skin you were born with, that that should not affect how much resources you get at the end of the day. Well, what about how smart you are, right? How smart you are is something you were born with. Uh, if you are in my class, you're probably pretty smart. You had no choice in that. Even if, and I know it may not be exactly something you're born with, but the other kinds of things that people think may go into intelligence, things like uh, early childhood nutrition, right? You may not have been born with that, but you didn't have any choice in that, right? If your parents read to you a lot when you were a child, fed you well, um, gave, passed on good genes to you, that's not something that it makes sense for you to be proud of, right? You didn't have any choice in that. On the other hand, if you were in a, if you were born into a situation where you got a very bad education, um, where you had poor childhood nutrition, where your parents were checked out and didn't read to you, um, you know that's also not something that you deserve to be punished for. You didn't have any choice in that. Now, what you do with it, you have a choice in, right? Liberal egalitarians want to say if you were if you were born with advantages that made you pretty intelligent. We should reward you if you if you take that intelligence and, and do a lot with it, develop it, work with it, that sort of thing. But the basic fact that you're born smart or strong or into a wealthy social stratum or um, you know with a perfectly functioning body versus one that's disabled in some way, this should not matter to in and of itself. This should typically not matter to the kinds of resources that you are given in the distribution. And finally, and this is something that really distinguishes egalitarians from especially libertarians, is that for most liberal egalitarians, the notion of freedom, the way they understand the freedom that is important to liberalism, is a substantive notion of freedom. So there's really at least two ways of thinking about what it means to be free. You can have a formal notion of freedom, or sometimes uh, this is sometimes called a negative notion of freedom. And that just means 
you are not restrained or interfered with in any way. A substantive notion of freedom, or sometimes called a positive notion of freedom, means that freedom means that you are, you are actually able to accomplish things. So, for instance, someone who is talking only about freedom in a negative sense would say, look, um, if you want to get an education at the University of Maryland, no one is stopping you. We don't have any discriminatory policies. We don't say that uh, if you're poor, you're not allowed to come here. But a person talking about the substantive notion of freedom, the positive notion of freedom, might say, well, yeah, but that doesn't, that doesn't help, right? If you're too poor to afford coming here, and we don't, we don't actually give need-based scholarships for the master's program, at least. If you're too poor to afford coming here, the fact that no one is stopping you is meaningless. You still, you still can't, can't go. Um, and so liberal egalitarians typically worry about this for society as a whole. They will say, um, even if there are, for instance, no longer any formal discriminatory laws on the basis of gender and race in American society. If women are typically in situations where they have to take care of children and don't have things like subsidized daycare to let them enter the workforce, they still, in some sense, are not f truly free to enter the workforce. If we base your ability to get certain jobs on how much education you've gotten and how good the education you've gotten is, we may not say you can't have this job if you are black. But if it turns out that in the US, many, many more black people uh, live in areas that have high poverty and poor school systems, this is effectively going to limit the freedom of blacks in the US. So liberal egalitarians often, when they think about problems in society, worry about the substantive notion of freedom that you are not really free unless not only are you not interfered with in the negative way, but you also have a certain minimum of resources that are necessary for actually exercising that, that freedom. Um, the old quip is that, uh, you know, the law is neutral. It tells both of the rich and the poor that they are not allowed to sleep under bridges. Okay. So, social contract theories. How do we work this out? How do we actually think about what a polity that embodies these liberal egalitarian ideals would look like? As I mentioned, the idea of the social contract is really a way of trying to reconcile, on the one hand, the notion that you need to respect everyone's freedom. And on the other hand, the notion that a polity is going to involve a system of coercive laws, right? The problem is obvious. When the government tells me I must pay taxes, or I may not murder, or I may not steal, if I want to do those things, I would really, I, I would love to murder people. Murdering people sounds splendid. Well, and then the police come and say, well, you're a free person, but you're not free to do that. How do we understand what's going on? How do we make sense of, you know, the man telling me I'm not allowed to just go murder whoever I want if I'm really free? And the way that liberal theories try to reconcile these two ideas is very often through some notion of a social contract. Some notion that the same way that if I make a promise and you hold me to that promise, you're not interfering with my freedom because I, I chose to make the promise. I didn't have to choose it. The idea is that society is kind of like a promise or kind of like a contract. We are not unfree when the police enforce the rules against us because we agreed to those rules. We chose those rules in some sense. Now, you'll notice that for the last few sentences, uh, at the end of almost every sentence, I've had to say, in some sense. Uh, one of my old professors used to joke that in some sense is an operator that makes whatever sentence it ends true. And this is part of the deep philosophical problem with social contract theories. Some of you listening to this may be naturalized citizens. 
Some of you may be members of the military or other kinds of social institutions where you explicitly agreed to follow the laws of the United States. But for most people who are Americans or most people who are citizens of any other nation state, the first thing that should come to mind when somebody says, well, look, you, you've agreed to these laws. That's why we're enforcing them against you. The first thing that should come to mind is, is you should say, when? I, I, don't, I don't remember doing that. Um, because most of us did not explicitly agree. Or, um, and again, I don't know if they still did this in your schools. You know, when I was seven, they made me say the Pledge of Allegiance, but we typically, we typically don't hold seven-year-olds to any contracts they made, right? So the mere fact that they have uh, school kids say pledges of allegiance or that sort of thing, those don't typical. That's not the kind of contract we would typically enforce. You know, I told Jeremy Corrado that we'd be best friends forever when we were in Cub Scouts, but uh, you know, I don't think anyone's going to come and sue me over that for the fact that we've lost touch. Uh, we don't hold people to those kinds of contracts. All right, so question is, when exactly did you agree to the contract that allows the police of the United States to enforce the laws of the US against you? There's a few options. The first option is that, well, maybe there was an actual contracting moment. Um, if you're looking at the slides, you'll notice I say Hobbes with a question mark. It's not exactly clear. I'm not a, a Hobbes exegete. I take it there's some argument about this in Hobbes scholarship, but he's the closest thing I can think of to someone who says, no, there was an actual contract made at some point. So Hobbes, uh, if you remember, or I, I shouldn't assume you've read Hobbes. If you, if you came out of this from a political science background, you should absolutely have read Hobbes at some point. Um, if you haven't, Go read it, The Leviathan. It's a you know 900 page page turner of uh, you know 16th century philosophy, 17th century philosophy. I'm horrible with dates. Anyway, um, so Hobbes famously said, "Human beings, humankind, started in the state of nature, and in the state of nature, what this means is there's there's no society." And Hobbes says, "Well, everyone is self-interested." and there's no society. So the state of nature is a war of all against all. If you have something that I want, well, I go take it. There's no law saying I can't. There's no one to stop me. Um, Hobbes does think that there's not even any kind of, there's not a, a, a natural morality that we would all adhere to. And even if I'm not particularly acquisitive, even if I don't want your stuff right now, fear will drive us into the war of all against all. Because I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, well, hmm, she doesn't have anything I want in particular, and she's not currently threatening me, but she might threaten me in the future. So if I have the chance to kill her now, I should probably do it. So she can't turn around and kill me, you know, if I have something that she wants, if I fall asleep. Um, and this is, a, this is going to be thoroughly unstable as a situation. No one will be able to trust anyone else. Everyone will be killing each other or trying to kill each other all the time. We'll all be devoting all of our resources into, uh, you know, becoming better and better at fighting, building more horrible spiked clubs out of things, uh, you know, watching our backs all the time, and life will be, in Hobbes' famous phrase, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. So how do we how, how do we get out of this? This sounds horrible. I you know you read Hobbes and you go I I Hobbes save me from this horrible horrible state of nature, and Hobbes says well okay, the way we get out of this is that rational human beings will look around and they will say uh, this is this is terrible and we'll all recognize that it's terrible, and we'll all recognize that uh, even if you have something I want, rather than having that. I would much rather not have to worry about you hitting me in the head with a big stick all the time. So we'll get together. We'll say, whoa, ho, ho, everybody, put your weapons down, and we'll all agree amongst each other to have a state. 
will all agree amongst each other to elect some to to appoint someone as the sovereign who will make the rules and will give uh, him the the ability to enforce them. You know, all of our big sticks will go to him and to his police force and yada yada yada. So. It's not absolutely clear in Hobbes that he really believed this is something that that literally happened sometime in prehistory. Sometimes in Leviathan he makes it sound like he does, other times he makes it sound like this is kind of a a, a myth, a just-so story about things. But if we imagine for if we imagine for a moment that okay, this is an actual contract that was really made, well, that sounds pretty good. But it runs into some pretty serious problems. And the, the biggest problem with it is that even if this was an actual contract that was actually made, it's not clear why it binds me or why it binds you. None of us were around when our ancestors at the misty dawn of time agreed to this. And so it's not clear why it says anything for us. Uh, similar things apply to less hippy-dippy philosophers' notions of... Uh, this may be the first time in history that Hobbes was ever called hippy-dippy, by the way. But to less philosophical notions of the state uh, of original actual contracts. A lot of people in the U.S., for instance, will appeal to the authority of the Constitution. The Constitution, of course, was an actual contract. But it runs into very similar problems. I didn't sign the Constitution. It's not clear why the fact that some guys a couple hundred years ago signed an agreement automatically means that I am bound by it. So, very few people, possibly not even Hobbes, actually believe in, really believed in an actual contracting moment. And in fact, more people who place, who think that only actual contracts could be binding, they're likely to end up as anarcho-libertarians rather than as uh, liberals of any stripe. Okay, so a different way of thinking about this is, is maybe it's an implicit contract. None of us actually agreed to the contract that sets up our laws, our nation state, and whatever. But maybe we've implicitly agreed to it. Uh, maybe there's something the equivalent of <clears throat> when you install anything on Windows and it says, you know, by using this program, you are agreeing to the terms of the licensing agreement. Locke uh, was a famous proponent of this view, and Locke held a view that, that a lot of people find very plausible. Um, Locke said, look, yes, no one has actually ever agreed to the contract that underlies a state's laws. But if you reach the age of maturity, you know, if you get to... Locke basically admits that, well, you know, people who are so young that they can't really make decisions for themselves... It doesn't make sense to think of them as being bound by the laws uh, in the in the right way. And Locke basically ignores them, and we'll get back to the problem with Locke ignoring them, but Locke basically ignores children and that sort of thing. Um, but for adults, Locke says every nation state has an implicit contracting moment, which is that if you live here, if you abide by the laws of the state, or actually, sorry, if you live here and if you benefit from the laws of the state, really is the idea, then you are implicitly agreeing to abide by them. You are, you are implicitly checking the I agree to the end user licensing agreement for the United States by sticking around, by letting the police protect you from crime, by going to a state supported institution like the University of Maryland, you are implicitly agreeing that in return, you'll follow the laws, you'll pay your taxes, whatever. This has, this is a lot more plausible than the actual contract theory, both in terms of did this really happen and in terms of does it actually bind people? Does it make sense to think of it as binding? But it runs into a couple of, of fairly deep problems. The first one that's a little bit more abstract is uh, it's not clear that you can make arbitrary implicit contracts, right? If I said, uh, by continuing to listen to uh, these lectures, you are agreeing that uh, once a week you will come over to my house and, and wash and tune up my bike, you know, you, you would laugh at that. Uh, you, you probably wouldn't even stop listening. Uh, because it's not the sort of thing that I, as your professor, can really demand that you do. I can demand certain other things, right? I can say, if you stay in this class, you are agreeing to do the assignments. 
uh, as long as the assignments are reasonable sorts of things. But because social contracts are the foundation for things, they can't really build in the notion that some things are appropriate and some things are not for the contract. They're foundational. They, they're before the rules. So there can't be rules about what's allowed to be in them. Uh, that's abstract. The more concrete problem, and I think in a lot of ways the bigger problem, is one that's attributable to Hume. Hume basically says, look, where, where, do, we, where do we really expect people to go? Um, Hume's analogy says, imagine that you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean, and the captain comes out and says, here are the rules of the ship. By remaining on this ship, you are implicitly agreeing to follow them. Well, that seems kind of unfair, right? Because your only options are stay on the ship or jump into the ocean and drown. Uh, nation states are similar. If I said, look, I, I don't like the rules of the United States, um, I'd have to leave. And that's a pretty big deal to ask of someone. Uh, first of all, there might be questions about where I can go. It's not so easy to just up stakes and move to another country. Uh, not every countries aren't bound to accept you, yada, yada, yada. Um, the other thing is, depending on what bothers me, there might be nowhere for me to go. Uh, you know, think about the, uh, the, the efforts of certain radical libertarians to find, you know, found nation states on abandoned oil rigs in the high seas. You know, if I'm a real radical anarcho-libertarian, there is nowhere that I can go live where the rules will agree with me. Uh, if I'm a radical Marxist, there is pretty much nowhere on the planet that I could go where the rules would agree with me. There's simply nowhere for me to go. Um, it's a huge deal to ask me to do it. There's nowhere for me to, not necessarily anywhere for me to go uh, that would exactly match with the rules that I want. Um, if I try to live outside of a state, uh, well, there's pretty much no place on the planet currently that's outside of a state. This is the, the death of the anarcho-libertarians' dreams about oil platforms, right? As soon as you build an oil platform, actually it turns out it counts as some state's territory under international law. So there's, in, in, in the current world, there's, there's almost literally nowhere you could go if you don't like the rules. And even if there is some place that you could go, right? So I, I look at Sweden and I say, I'm a, I'm a bleeding heart liberal. I want to go to Sweden. Now I can get NPR on the internet, so it's all good. Um, I like snow. I want to move to Sweden. Even if Sweden will accept me, it's still a huge thing to ask of someone if they don't like the rules to do that, right? If I wanted to move to Sweden, I have to move my entire family, I'll be cut off from my current family and friends, it'd be very expensive, I'd have to leave my house behind, yada, yada, yada. So a lot of people have, have followed Hume and saying, look, this implicit contract thing is a little bit um, morally implausible. That what we really want to say to people is, if you don't like the rules, uh, you are implicitly agreeing to them if you don't completely uproot your life and move out of a nation, move out of the nation state. So, the last option, and the one that's actually the most popular currently, is to have a kind of hypothetical contract. To say, look, this is not, when we talk about the contract, this isn't something that you actually agreed to. It's also not something really that you implicitly agree to. It's something that you would agree to if you were being reasonable. Now, the advantage of this is clear. It makes perfect sense to talk about what I would agree to if I was being reasonable. And then we can argue about what reasonable people would agree to and that sort of thing. But we can make sense of the notion. The question, of course, that arises with hypothetical contracts is why should any of that be morally binding on us? Um, think of it this way. It might be that I ought to sell you my house. It would be better for everyone involved. Um, you would give me a price that's good for it. You want to live here. I'd be able to buy a place somewhere else or rent a place somewhere else that I would like living in better. You know, all of the all, all the things would turn out to mutual advantage 
uh, if I were to sell you my house. Nonetheless, we don't typically think that means that you own my house, right? And I say typically, but, but really, both of us would be crazy to think that that meant that, that you own my house, right? If I, if you walked into my house and said, all right, I'm moving in, and uh, don't worry, there's money in your bank account, I could rightfully say, no, 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 this doesn't work. I didn't ever agree to this. And the fact that you, that you argue me into accepting that I should agree to it doesn't mean that I did. It doesn't have the same moral force of actually agreeing to it. Um, and in fact, some people think that an important part of respecting individuals as free individuals is that we let them even do things that are unreasonable if that's what they choose. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I mean, this is a deep problem. There's not actually really a resolution to it. Uh, we're just going to bracket it for the moment. But nonetheless, um, the hypothetical contract does seem to capture at least some part of the idea. Maybe it's special to to political contracts that we accept them. But uh, that's actually the way that a lot of liberal theorists have gone, uh, both egalitarians and otherwise. OK. So what could these hypothetical contracts look like. We're going to talk about two of them because they're two really major ones, um, the first one especially. The first one is John Rawls, and he began developing his concept of this in a book called Theory of Justice, which is his most famous one, and Rawls is still sort of the liberal egalitarian to beat. Uh, almost everyone is going to talk about Rawls, either they're and almost everyone is either sort of a Rawlsian or they're going to talk about why they are not a Rawlsian. So he really shapes a lot of the debate in political theory. Okay. So what does Rawls's hypothetical contract look like? Rawls has this concept, he uses this concept that he calls the veil of ignorance. And what he essentially argues is that if we imagine ourselves into this situation where we are behind the veil of ignorance, the contract, the structure of society that we decide on there is the one that we should accept for our, for our, actual, for our actual society, would be justified for our actual society. So first, the veil of ignorance is individualistic. Uh, when you are behind the veil of ignorance, the assumption is that you are trying to make choices that will maximize your own interests, however those interests might be defined. So you are rational in the economic sense of rational. You're trying to maximize outcomes for yourself. The second part of it is what he builds in to capture his notion of fairness. And for Rawls, what makes this veiled, what makes this the veil of ignorance, is that when you are behind it, you don't know specifics about yourself. Um, you don't know, first of all, you don't know lots of the normal stuff, right? You don't know whether you're a man or a woman. You don't know whether you are, uh, what your ethnic background is. You don't know how, um, well, you, you'll live your whole life. So you, you'll know that you'll live through all of the, the age categories. Um, you don't know what nation you'll live in. Uh, you don't know whether you will be born poor or born wealthy, or at least born into a, a, a poorer segment of society, however we structure it, or a wealthier segment of society, however we structure it. You don't know what you know. You don't know where on the planet you'll be born, that sort of thing. But also, uh, most importantly, you don't know certain things about what your moral outlook is. For Rawls, especially, you do not know your religion. Uh, you don't know what your beliefs about religion are. And you don't know what your substantive concept of the good is. So you don't know whether you are the kind of person who values a quiet family life, or the kind of person who values material luxury, or spiritual fulfillment, or adventure and travel. You don't know what you think of as good. We'll get back to what this means in a minute. And the result of all of this is that the outcome, whatever basic structure of society you decide on after you are done with this, um, the outcome is justified because it's what you would choose if you were rational, but not biased towards yourself. 
The point of not knowing things like what you think of as the good life or what your gender is, is that our intuitive concept, Rawls thinks, of fairness means that it shouldn't matter what gender you are. And so being ignoring this when you're behind the veil of ignorance is a way of ensuring that the basic structure of society doesn't favor one gender over another. Um, you know, you if you don't know whether you're going to be a man or a woman, you would not want a society where women are disadvantaged or where men are disadvantaged, right? You would neither have uh, Saudi Arabia nor Amazonia as the society that you would want to create. Okay, so what do we get out of this if we do this? The first thing is important um, to Rawls is that he thinks that if we successfully um, follow the rules of the veil of ignorance, because it essentially essentially means that we don't know who we are, everyone would come up with the same rules. Now, the important part of this is that means that we don't actually have to get people together and do this. We don't actually have to get a whole bunch of people together and wipe their minds and, and let them contract. We can all imagine in our armchair what the contract would look like because we'd all come to the same conclusion. Thanks, Rawls. Okay. So what do we get out of this for Rawls? The first thing that, that Rawls thinks we would agree on is that we would prioritize liberty. So we would not be consequentialists is part of it. We would not want a society that says anyone could be, for instance, enslaved. Because we would say, well, I don't know. We might end up as a slave and we don't want to take that chance, right? If you don't know whether or not you're one of the people who would be enslaved, you probably are just not going to want to have an institution of slavery. So what Rawls thinks is that you will end up with a certain set of fundamental liberties that will be privileged, that no amount of other goods uh, could justify taking them away. And these are, for Rawls, Rawls thinks we would come up with largely the kinds of things that uh, Americans think of as civil liberties. We would have uh, freedom of conscience, uh, so you could follow whatever religion you want or no religion without persecution. Um, freedom of speech, freedom of association, you can hang out with whoever you like. Um, freedom from arbitrary harm, so you know, right to life, uh, that sort of thing. Importantly, uh, and this is, this is where we get to the distributive justice part, property rights are not on this list for Rawls. We would not prioritize any kind of substantive property right before other kinds of consequential outcomes. Okay. So, first we prioritize liberty. We say whatever, whatever happens, the polity has to respect these liberties. The second thing, when we get to the distribution part, once we say, okay, look, everyone has freedom of speech, yada, 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 but there's still all this stuff and we need to figure out who gets what. Rawls thinks that the, what we would decide on is uh, what he calls the difference principle. And the difference principle is, uh, it's a way of justifying inequalities in society that respects this liberal egalitarian commitment to the idea that equality is the baseline, deviations need to be justified. So Rawls thinks that what we would agree to is uh, what he calls, first of all, on the on the broad sense, a maximin principle. We would agree to a principle on which the worst off people in society are as well off as we can make them. So for Rawls, any deviation from pure equality of resources has to be justified by the fact that the inequality makes the worst off person better off. So. For instance, this allows for things like one of the standard arguments for capitalism, that it, it creates inequalities, yes, but it grows the pie at the same time. Rawls would accept a capitalist system, thinks we would accept a capitalist system as long as it is set up properly so that, you know, allowing somebody to make more money if they work harder ultimately helps everybody in society, ultimately gives more resources even to the worst off people. You know, it's a rising tide that lifts all boats. It's not just creating inequality overall. And then there are two subordinate things that allow Rawls 
uh, Rawls thinks that we need in our basic structure in order to create this kind of maximin distribution. Um, first, any inequalities there are uh, should be, this is his phrase, they should be attached to offices open to talents. So he thinks that the inequal we would not agree to inequalities that even if they benefited people, and he thinks mostly because they would not benefit people, right? We would not agree to inequalities that say things like white people get 10% more money than anybody else, right? We would not agree to inequalities that say there is a royal bloodline and people from the royal bloodline get 10% more resources than anybody else. The inequalities in society in order to make this work, they need to be attached to roles, jobs or something else of that nature. Um, offices open to talents is his phrase. So if we agree to inequalities, we're going to agree to inequalities that look like doctors get paid more, professors get paid more. We probably wouldn't agree to that, but for the sake of argument. Um, and then they're open to talents. This is a meritocratic requirement. So if we say doctors get paid more, then the only rules for whether or not you become a doctor should be that you have the talents that are required for doctoring, that you're a good person to be a doctor. The other side of this is that um, there should be fair equality of opportunity. And this goes back to the substantive freedom point. Fair equality of opportunity requires formal equality of opportunity. It requires that if doctors get paid more, we don't say, and women cannot be doctors. Fair equality of opportunity requires that we build into the structure of society a system to ensure that, as much as we can, people are able to achieve whatever roles there are without any kind of structural discrimination against them without any problems from the fact that they were born into a group that is not able to develop talents in the right way, right? So again, this comes back to this issue that whatever talents you have are largely unchosen by you, but they're affected both by what you might be born with and by the social position that you're born into. So, for instance, this is the part that, that makes a lot of uh, folks who are, other, who are generally Rawlsian outlook um, believe that we need to have things like a public education system. Public education system is not inherently about redistributing wealth, but the public education system ensures that even if you are born into a very poor family, for instance, if you're smart, you will be able to get an education that allows you to take advantage of that smartness and become a doctor or become whatever whatever you want. Uh, so that to the extent possible, we will not discriminate against anyone just because of where in the society they happen to have been born. Okay, so that's Rawls. Uh, Rawls thinks that we, and this is, he's spent a lot of time developing this, a lot of people spend a lot of time reacting to it, but this is one picture of a liberal egalitarian theory. We build our society in such a way that we have a certain list of liberties that get priority, and then we distribute and redistribute wealth in a way to maximize the uh, how well off the worst off are. Some of that redistribution might be direct. You know, we might just tax people and give money to the poor. And some of that redistribution might be indirect. We might tax people to spend on public education. Okay. <clears throat> The other one that Kimlicka talks about, and it's worth talking about a little bit because it's interestingly different, is Dworkin's hypothetical contract. Because uh, Dworkin is trying to fix what he sees as a couple of problems with Rawls's approach. And Kimlicka gets into this a lot in nerdy detail. I just want to run over some of the major issues that are involved. One of the big problems with liberal egalitarian contracts and with this ideal of ambition sensitivity and endowment insensitivity is how do we, we get a thread a needle. We want to compensate for natural inequalities, but without unfairly compensating people for chosen inequalities. This is Kim Lico's tennis player example, but this is, um, I think, a fairly straightforward idea. The idea is that there are at least two ways that you might end up poor, you know, sort of two abstract ways you might end up poor. One way 
that you might end up poor is because you never got a fair shot or some tragedy befell you that was no fault of your own. The other way that you might end up poor is because you chose not to work very hard. You chose not to develop whatever talents you had. You chose not to go do the things that would have get, gotten you more wealth. Um, and as a result, there's kind of a problem because intuitively, we want to compensate the people who are poor because of tragedy. We don't really want to compensate the people who are poor because, you know, we want to be ambition sensitive, right? We don't want to compensate the people who are poor because they chose not to work. Um, you know, and in fact, you can see a lot of the argument between, uh, you know, now in the American sense, liberals and conservatives about what to do about the poor, about sort of what proportion of the poor do you think fall into each of the categories, right? You're much more likely to favor extensive redistributive welfare systems if you think that most people who are poor are there through something that's no fault of their own. You are much more likely to favor restriction of those things if you think that most people who are poor are poor because they, they have chosen to be poor. They're, they're lazy or otherwise, you know, uh, in there because of their own their own fault. So you get this problem. How do you, how do you figure this out? Um, and, you know, for a actual, for an actual social contract, it would be very difficult to say something like, well, we're going to go check on everyone and uh, decide whether to give them food stamps based on our judgment of whether or not it's their fault that they're poor or not. Uh, you know, first of all, this would be incredibly invasive. Second of all, it would end up with all sorts of problems like, well, who is deciding? Um, who is checking? So we want to have some sort of general principle that will, that will thread this needle as best as we can. The second problem is Rawls, as Kimlicka points out, doesn't really deal that well with natural inequalities. When Rawls talks about distribution and distribution benefiting the least well-off, he's talking about least well-off in terms of the amount of resources they have, the amount of money, social status, land, whatever else is, whatever else is valuable. Um, well, it's not whatever else is valuable. It's the, the amount of primary goods, like wealth, that they have. Now, these are things that are generically useful. The primary goods are generically useful. Because again, the, the whole idea behind liberalism is that it does not decide between substantive notions of what's good. Um, you know, everyone can agree that having more wealth is generically better than having less wealth, right? Even if your notion of, even if it turns out your notion of the good is to live a life of monastic asceticism, Rawls is going to say, and most liberal egalitarians are going to say, well, nothing stops you from giving away your money. Um, you know, having more money can't hurt you, certainly, in your pursuit of the good. And for lots of concepts of the good, it can help you. So you're going to want, in this hypothetical veil of ignorance situation, you're going to, you're going to want as much money as you think you can get. Um, so when Rawls talks about maximizing the well-being of the least well-off, he's typically talking about things like getting as much money, or whatever the equivalent in your society is, to the people who have the least money. If you allow natural inequalities in here, that sort of messes up the maximum principle. Because then you're stuck saying, well, look, if you take two people with equal amounts of money, but one of them is severely physically disabled, there is a sense in which, there's a, you know, I don't want to get, there's a lot of debate about how to understand disability. So I'm stepping on some toes here and you can, you can nail me on it later if you would like. But there's a very intuitive sense in which if an able-bodied person like myself or like most of you in the class and a severely physically disabled person, someone who can't walk on their own, uh, have the same amount of money, that we're, we're not going to be equally well off because the disabled person will have to spend some of their money compensating for their disability. If I want to go somewhere, I can walk there. A disabled person might have to buy a wheelchair, right? They might have to uh, hire a car service to bring them there. Now, of course, we might, societally, we might pay for this, so it's free to them, but that's exactly the kind of thing that needs to be, needs to be justified, right? Um, 
you know, we, we that's the kind of thing that, that, well, all right, if we want to say that because without anything else, giving $1,000 to an able-bodied person and giving $1,000 to a disabled person is not going to make them equally well off. We need to give the disabled person $1,000 plus a free car service. Well, that's something that we need to build into the social contract, you know, because that the money for that car service is going to come from somewhere. And this gives rise to a second problem, which is that once we recognize this, and Kimlicka thinks this is why Rawls sort of avoids the question, once we recognize this, part of the problem is, well, how do we then avoid unlimited consequences? compensation for natural inequalities. Um, and again, stepping on some some toes about disability rights and, and uh, sort of ableism. The intuitive problem is that there might be some people for whom no amount of resources would make them truly as well off as someone who did not have their disability. So we might be willing to say that for someone who can't walk on their own, uh, maybe if we provide them with free car service, free wheelchairs, free, you know, whatever, we can make them as well off as someone who could walk under their own power. But someone who is severely mentally disabled, there might be no amount of resources that will make their life as good as someone who doesn't suffer from that disability. But at the same time, you know, they might sort of asymptotically approach it. Uh, each additional bit of resources we give them uh, might make them better off uh, without ever making them completely as well off, right? So think about it this way, and again, uh, this minefield here, but hopefully this is not too, too far off base. For many of us, if you said, look, would you rather live your life the way it is or would you rather be, uh, you know, severely mentally handicapped, but fabulously wealthy, right? Many people, I think, reasonably would say, well, no, I, I would rather be less wealthy, but, but, not, but not disabled. But on the other hand, if you say, well, look, would you rather be severely mentally disabled and poor or severely mentally disabled and fabulously wealthy? Well, of course, being severely mentally disabled and fabulously wealthy is better um, even if no matter how wealthy you are, you might not choose to be disabled and wealthy over being uh, able-bodied and able-minded, able able-brained, uh, and uh, you know only reasonably well off. So once you accept natural inequalities, if you want to say we define how well off the least well off person is in part in terms of how well off they are considering all of the n natural inequalities they might have, well, then you, you run into the problem that you might have these bottomless utility pits, right? You might have these people who, you might have certain people in society, you might be worried about being one of these people behind the veil of ignorance, um, for whom you're, any amount of resources will not make them uh, as well off as other people in society, but each bit of resources makes them better off. And so Maximin taking natural disability into account might look like a recipe where we give all of the resources to the people who are, who are um, very severely disabled in, in certain ways uh, and leave nothing for anybody else. And that also seems wrong. So Dworkin has an interesting hypothetical solution. Uh, Dworkin tries to capture something very similar to Rawls in that the fundamental thing that we do behind the veil of ignorance for Dworkin is we have a kind of auction for resources. We get to bid on what we would want. Um, this allows us to make some distinction between natural and chosen inequalities because we can bid on the kinds of things that we want for Dworkin. If I want a life of, um, you know, a life of reasonably okay idleness, right? I want to live in a rural area. I don't care about having a lot of money. Um, you know, I can bid on a plot of land and, uh, you know, some seeds to grow food, and that's fine. And if you want to be a high-powered business magnate, you can bid on education and that sort of thing. Uh, and we equalize the buying power here, right? So we, we avoid the, the, the inequality problem that things like cost-benefit analysis have or willingness to pay have, where you're, you're, you're saying, what would we spend, what kinds of resources would we spend for if we all started with an equal amount of auction power? Um, so that's how we distribute things. And, and 
Dworkin thinks that for most people, for people who are, you know, if we assumed away any kind of natural disadvantage, this would end up with something that looks kind of like a Rawlsian picture, where you've got structures that are maximin, you've got structures that allow people who want to spend a lot of time in school and work hard and make more money to become doctors, and people who don't want to spend a lot of time in school and don't want to work hard and are okay with making less money to, you know, do something else. But one of the things we can buy is insurance against natural disability. Behind the veil of ignorance, we don't know. You don't know whether you're someone who's not going to be able to walk. You don't know whether you're someone who's going to have a severe mental disability. So one of the things you can do is you can buy a certain degree of insurance. You can say, I'm willing to spend you know, 30 clamshells out of my 100 clamshells that everyone gets on insurance. And the amount you spend basically goes into a pool that will be used to make everyone who has severe disabilities better off than they otherwise otherwise would be, right? So if everybody spends 30 clams on the, you know, disability insurance fund, then we spend that much, you know, we spend 30% of the total societal resources on compensating for natural disadvantages. And, uh, you know, that way, people who are disabled, people who do suffer from natural disadvantages, they get some compensation, but not unlimited. And we have a notion of how much compensation is reasonable based on how much would people pay to avoid some of the effects of disability. Dworkin thinks there'll be a determinate amount, because of course we've got to spend a portion of society on this. And then the real world interpretation of this is uh, basically taxation for social programs, right? The real world interpretation of this is that if hypothetically we would all spend 30% of our starting fund on uh, help for people who are naturally disadvantaged, that means in the real world we tax and we spend 30% of societal resources on things like uh, mobility services and special education and, you know, whatever else will help people who have various kinds of natural disadvantages. Okay, so that's Dworkin's model. Now, this still has some problems. It still suffers from this problem of, well, how do we tell the difference between a natural disadvantage and an unnatural disadvantage? Dworkin's response is basically that, well, we can't really, and the best approximation is that people who are very poor get some benefits from this. Um, because again, natural disadvantage is not just being disabled. It might be things like, um, being born into a family where your parents don't raise you very well, right? That's a, still a natural disadvantage. You had no choice in that, um, and you might be less able to compete in society if you have a if you if you were born into a situation like that. Okay, there are a couple serious challenges to um, liberal egalitarianism. This should be unsurprising. Not everyone is a liberal egalitarian, so there are some reasons why people are not. Um, the first is, and this is a combination, if you're reading, following along in the Kimlicka, this is a combination of some of his concerns in the politics of liberal egalitarianism section, or politics, politics of liberalism section, um, and the uh, feminist challenges. So, but really what they all center on is the question of whether liberalism entails that we fix inequalities in the system ex ante or ex post, whether we fix inequalities of the system by structuring the system so that it is less unequal, or whether we fix them by letting the system do whatever it wants and then skimming off the top and redistributing in some way. So as Kim Luka points out, liberal egalitarianism is very commonly seen as the kind of theoretical underpinning of welfare state capitalism. The theoretical underpinning of a system like we have in the US to a large extent, where we have a fairly unregulated, unrestricted market. It's not completely unregulated, unrestricted, but you know, pretty free markets. More free even than Europe, and, and Europe basically is our, our free market systems. And then we have a system of taxation and redistribution tacked on on top of that. So essentially what we do is we let the market run and do whatever it wants, and then we take X percent of, of people's uh, wealth at the end of it and spread it back around in a different way. The problem with this is that just doing redistribution after the fact doesn't necessarily fix all of the problems. You know, it fixes the problem of who has how much money. You know, 
we can we can create a ba almost a, an arbitrary uh, distribution. Um, you know, we could distribute everything so that it would be perfectly equal, right? This might make people not want to work. It might have other kinds of bad effects. But in principle, it's possible to have completely laissez-faire capitalism than just tax everyone and redistribute it so that everyone ends up with the same amount of money at the end of the day. But even if you did that, it potentially leaves a lot of bad things there, right? So imagine um, someone in a really low status or especially degrading job, arguably degrading job. Um, and again, this is a, another kind of minefield, right? But uh, there are lots of jobs in our society that, aside from the pay, are, you know, not very good and are and especially are, are subject to lots of abuses, right? So, especially jobs that are very often done by the poor, by women, and by racial minorities, and which sort of adds an additional level of odiousness to it. So, take something like um, food service work, right? Someone who works at Subway or McDonald's or that sort of thing. There are a lot of problems with those jobs besides the fact that they don't pay very well, right? They're not typically very well respected in our society. You know, if you're a high schooler and you work at McDonald's, that, that's fine. If you're an adult and you work at McDonald's, um, you know, this is not going to get you lots of respect. Right. This is this is going to be emblematic to a lot of people, a symbol of you know you not being very successful overall. People are not going to say, oh, that's something to look up to. You're also subject to lots of potentially degrading sorts of situations, right? Um, you know, if you've gone into McDonald's recently, people don't usually treat the cashiers that well. Uh, you know, people are not typically very polite to them. Uh, you know, some people are polite, but a lot of people are not. And you kind of have to take it if you're in a job like that. Um, you have to work under fairly unpleasant conditions. You know, if you want to, if you're hunched over a fryer all day, that's not a very pleasant situation to be in. Um, there are other jobs that have this, that have this sort of thing, right? If you, if you work doing garbage collection, if you work in lots of factories, right? So, I mean, think about, um, uh, conditions that so I was ugh, sorry I'll lean back up uh, I was just listening to on this American life because again I your professor is a typical bleeding heart liberal and listens to NPR all the time uh, there was recently a couple weeks ago a piece by a fellow who had gone and looked at the factories in which Apple makes iPads and other things in in Shenzhen in China and the conditions there as he described them, were, were, were pretty rough. Uh, workers worked very long days. They uh, were subject to arbitrary firings and punishments. They worked under fairly unpleasant, possibly inhospitable conditions, yada, yada, yada. So you might think that at the end of the day, um, even if you were to say, well, we're going to give you, we're going to tax and give, give you a lot more money than you would be getting, that wouldn't fix all the problems with this kind of work. Um, it wouldn't fix the problem that professions historically associated with women, like domestic work, care of the elderly, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, pretty much domestic work like cleaning, house cleaning, care of the elderly, care of children, are not high status in our society. Redistributing money is not going to change that. Um, it wouldn't change the fact that lots of people who do these jobs are in a kind of social gray zone that allows them to be exploited in various kinds of ways in a, in a lot of situations. Um, you know, that's not going to be changed by, by just redistrib redistributing money after the fact. And it also, it potentially distorts the ethos of equality. Right. Even if at the end of the day, at, at the end of the day, people have basically the same amount of money, or they have a fair amount of money at the end of the day, it turns the picture into one where redistributing the wealth looks more like a form of charity. 
and you can see this distortion of ethos potentially in the in the U.S. Right? Um, when a lot of people in the U.S. look at welfare programs, the way they think about it is not well, certain people are naturally disadvantaged through no fault of their own, and the money that we pay in social support programs like unemployment insurance, uh, TANF, food stamps, and whatever, uh, this is just their due as contributors to the social whole who happen to you know, not get a fair shake from, the, from the, the system as it is. Lots of people see this as a kind of charity. They see this as, you know, giving people something that they should be thankful for, not giving them something that they deserve. And a system where we never even got to that point, right? A system where nobody needed food stamps because everybody had the resources to, you know, the mental and social resources to be in a job that already paid well and gave them good social standing, that sort of thing, would be preferable in terms of what we're trying to model when we talk about equality. And importantly, uh, you know, Rawls himself recognized this problem. Uh, Rawls, Kim look at us and talk about, I think it was his last book, a uh, book called Justice is Fairness. But Rawls basically says, look, my theory is often taken to be a defense of welfare state capitalism, but it's not. Rawls said that the only, Kimlicka mentions one of them, which I think is the one he mentions in Theory of Justice. Rawls says the only systems that uh, are capable of being just in his sense, of satisfying what he thinks would be a reasonable social contract from behind the veil of ignorance, are property owning democracy, which Kimlicka is right. Rawls never really gives a really detailed picture of what a property owning democracy would look like. But, um, the, the implication is it's one where wealth, stable property, is much more widely distributed than it is in our society. Um, and in particular, Rawls is, is very, very skeptical of intergenerational transfer of wealth. Because this is sort of the paradigm of undeserved wealth, right? The, the money that I am socking away in the bank for my three-year-old daughter is money that she does not deserve in any meaningful sense. Um, so Rawls, at the very least, a property owning democracy would mean that you severely tax intergenerational transfers so that you can grant people a larger share of property to try to do things with. Um, and this gives them, for instance, the you know better ability to uh, you know get education for themselves. It gives them potentially more political power and that sort of thing. Um, in a lot of ways, I think Rawls's ultimate picture of property and democracy is very similar to the stakeholder society that uh, Kimlicka talks about. This is this idea um, where you would have a very heavy wealth tax, and then when everyone in the society, when they turned 18, would just be given a lump sum, right? We say, when you turn 18, this is when you start being responsible for yourself. You're not really fully responsible for anything that happened up to this point. So we give you, you know, $80,000 or $100,000 or whatever to do with what you will. Pay for college, start a business, travel the world, whatever you want to do. Uh, and you can see the affinity between that kind of idea and uh, uh, Dworkin's wealth equalized idealized auction. Okay. Uh, the other one that Rawls thought would work would be what he calls democratic socialism, uh, which is very similar. Again, he doesn't really work out the details, but as I understand it, very similar to what's sometimes called market socialism. This would be a system in which there was personal property. Um, you know, you could own your clothes and a car and a house and whatever, but businesses and capital, uh, you know, the means of production in the Marxist sense would be collectively owned in some sense. Um, there'd be a political democracy and then personal property, but, you know, factories would be collectively owned. Large industrial equipment would be collectively owned. Uh, certain kinds of land might be collectively owned. Uh, so this is the kind of concern that, uh, you know, you, if you just fix things after the fact, you're not getting at the generators of equality, of inequality in the way that you ought to. And in a, system, in a situation where you know, we gave everyone whatever we gave, you know, we made sure that everyone started out with a good chunk of wealth, then we wouldn't be in a situation of saying, oh, well, now that you're 50, we're 
paying for food stamps for you and it's a kind of charity. We'd ideally be in a situation where, well, when people hit 50, they typically would not end up needing that. Okay. So, there are some deeper, more critical challenges. Some of them are essentially versions of the ex post ex ante challenge. So, um, for instance, some forms of feminist challenge to Rawls are kind of a, Oaken falls into this category, or kind of attempts to out Rawls Rawls to say, for instance, uh, Rawls explicitly says the family is not a realm of justice. Uh, we don't apply the theory of justice to distribution within the family. And in fact, in some statements of it, he takes the people in the original position to represent not individuals, but families. And then distribution within the family is done on its own. So some folks will say, like Oaken, um, this is actually, this is a huge problem. And it's a huge problem in the vein of the ex post ex ante problem, where if we have a society in which women are expected to raise the children and child raising is typically uncompensated work, the fact that we maybe then take some money and give it to, give it to women who are not in the workforce and don't have resources of their own, this does not fix the problem. Right? It still leaves women in a situation where um, they are effectively at the mercy of men. It leaves women in a situation where they're low status, all those problems. But there are also deeper versions of the challenge. And this goes to what uh, Kimlicka talks about under the heading of the ethic of care. So there's a sense in which all of these social contract theories, and especially all of the liberal egalitarian social contract theories, start from the idea that what would justify, especially the egalitarian ones, right? They start from the idea that what would justify our society is that autonomous, fully rational, reasonable, fair people would agree to it. And then we set about trying to adjust the picture for the fact that we say, well, okay, not everyone's idealized in this way, right? Not everyone's fully rational. Not everyone's fully autonomous. People suffer from all different kinds of disabilities. Um, you know, we try to sort of fix the system to try to make everyone in the society uh, first of all, we create a contract that assumes that everyone in the contract is this fully autonomous, freestanding, unencumbered individual. And then the way we interpret this in our society is we try to say, we say, look, let's try to make everyone in the society as close to the unencumbered individual as possible, right? So we take the unencumbered person as the ideal. Right, the indiv autonomous individual is the ideal, and then we say, well, people with disabilities fall away from the norm. Let's try to make them more like the norm by compensating them. Women who have to take care of young children fall away from the norm. Let's make them more like the norm through, you know, creating state-sponsored uh, daycare systems, that sort of thing. Uh, we essentially take what Kimlicka calls following McKinnon the difference approach. We understand, you know, we say the, the problem of women in our society is that, well, we certainly don't want to go back to the days where we had explicit discrimination against women. And if we care at all about sort of structural ways in which they're disadvantaged, what we do is we try to make them more like men, right? We, you know, we, so to take the example that uh, Kimlicka uses, take something like the fact that most jobs assume that from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. roughly, every day, every weekday, you will be able to be at your job and not having to take care of a child. First of all, we say, all right, well, we're going we're gonna to get rid of any rule that says, well, you have to be a man to have this job. We'll say, okay, then it's, it's not about whether you're a man or not. Um, it's just about whether or not you are taking care of a child. And if you happen to be a man who's taking care of a child, so much the worse for you. If you happen to be a childless woman, great, you're fine, it doesn't matter. If we want to go a bit further, we might say something like, oh, right, okay, so typically women in our society are the ones who end up taking care of young children. Well, 
The way to help women is to make them more like men, at least socially speaking. So we keep the structure of the job the same, but we say, okay, well, we'll have, um, we'll have state, state funded daycare. We'll have on-site daycare, whatever. We'll have something that allows you to become unencumbered by children exactly the way that men are, are typically unencumbered by children. So some feminists, for instance, have, especially feminists, have questioned whether this is, the, is really the ideal, right? They've said, look, it's great. Certainly a system where, you know, the male paradigm is privileged and we spend some resources trying to help women achieve that male paradigm more closely. Okay, that's better than one where we don't. Okay, that's nobody that Virginia Hell, McKinnon, Andrea Dworkin, nobody denies that things like getting rid of explicit discrimi discrimination uh, is, is a good thing. But the deeper question is, is this paradigm of the fully autonomous in unencumbered person um, is this really, is this a, you know, basically, is this a human being? Um, and some folks, not just feminists, in fact, uh, a, a very prominent example of this is a guy named Alistair McIntyre, who we'll hear a bit more about later, but wrote a very interesting book called Dependent Rational Animals. The ethics of care folks essentially want to say no. It's not that the moral ideal is the autonomous, invulnerable individual. And, uh, but of course, in the real world, people fall short of that ideal. In the real world, what makes people human, what is characteristic of, of humanity, is not autonomy, but vulnerability and dependence. What's characteristic of humanity is not individualism, but, but connection to a social web. Uh, so they want to say, it's not that if you are disabled, you are weird and different, and we need to specially compensate for you. It's that being, say, severely physically disabled is just a more intense version of the situation that we all find ourselves in. Uh, McIntyre, who Kim Lucas doesn't talk about, points out that, look, all of us, all of us are intensely vulnerable as babies. Right? This goes back to the, the bit about Locke ignoring children, right? You know, we build these individualist liberal moral theories that ignore the fact that all of us spend a huge portion of our time intensely vulnerable as babies. We can't contract. We need protection. We need people to give us stuff that we don't deserve. Right? Again, I have a three-year-old. My three-year-old doesn't deserve anything, more or less. She's, you know, just becoming a creature with a personality. Uh, certainly when she was six weeks old. Like, we fed her, not because she deserved it, because, but because that's what you do. Um, and if you tie yourselves, if, you know, why tie ourselves in knots trying to explain how caring for the vulnerable is somehow justified indirectly by this ideal of the autonomous individual, right? By like, well, she doesn't deserve it, but I'm trying to create her into the kind of person that she deserves to, that, that would deserve things. Why not take our vulnerability as primary? We spend a chunk of our lives, all of us, intensely vulnerable as children. You know, if all goes well, we'll spend a chunk of our lives, all of us, well, not all of us, but those of us who get there will spend a chunk of our lives intensely vulnerable as elderly people. All of us experience moments, even when we're not very young or very old, we all experience times when we are sick, when we need care from others uh, and are intensely vulnerable. So. The care ethicists basically want to say, what if we took human connection and dependence and vulnerability as the paradigm rather than human independence? Uh, and a lot of them, you know, this is often associated with kind of a left-wing politics. A lot of them want to say, the notion of the freestanding autonomous individual, that's not a human being. That, that's a, a creature of essentially capitalist ideology of industrial capitalism. You know, the autonomous, freestanding human being who has no family or whose family is taken care of by the state, who can move around whenever, who makes contracts and is held in, and all the moral rules are being held to those contracts. This is, this is not the picture of a human being. This is a picture of, of a, a human machine that we need to be able to plug into an industrial system of production. So uh, they say, well, let's, let's not start with that. Let's not even start with 
the liberal ideal of a system of justice that applies to creatures like that. And then try to, you know, because then we're forced to try to make ourselves into creatures like that um, on pain of being sort of these, these margin cases. So I could do a whole thing, and this is already getting long, about uh, care ethics. And I'm, I'm fascinated by them, so as you can probably tell, we can talk about them later. But essentially, all of the care ethicists develop various theories that focus on the moral value of particularistic connections. And they think on the political level of polities not of ways of fairly resolving disputes and distributing resources among rational autonomous individuals who are all self-interested, but of fostering different kinds of relationship, fostering uh, you know these dense social networks, and of providing the resources that allow all of us to live good lives in the face of our own vulnerabilities. Okay, more specifically, one of the concerns that comes from this sort of critical challenge, and this is, uh, so care ethics is largely associated with feminism. Uh, other kinds of critical challenges have similar structures and, and have similar ideas. Um, but one big issue is that a focus on these sort of abstract, universalizable pictures of autonomous individuals contracting can be barriers to paying attention to particularistic histories of domination. If you are the Rawlsian contractor, it's a little bit unclear whether you know, for instance, that blacks were slaves in America. You know, Rawls sometimes talks as if we're talking about creating a polity de novo uh, without any history. And if you, sometimes when he was pushed on these issues, you say, well, look, I'm doing ideal theory. I'm not telling you exactly what we ought to do to respond to actual injustices in the world. Um, what I'm doing is telling you what a perfect society would look like that you can use as a guide to fixing our society. But some people say that doesn't actually provide us that useful a guide. Um, you know, for instance, the ideal Rawlsian society would be race blind. Offices are open to talents. Doesn't matter what color you are. An actual society may not need may need to not be race blind. It may need systems like affirmative action. This is something we can argue about, but but it's at least plausible that in actual American society we may need affirmative action for women, for oppressed minorities, and this sort of thing. Uh, and some people have said that the Rawlsian picture, the ideal of the race blind society, does not give us a good guide for what we should actually do. It's not a meaningful political morality. The second deep problem is that this focus on autonomy and universalizability may devalue the particularistic attachments that we have. Um, Rawls, going back to this issue of the family, Rawls has some difficulty with the family. Because on the one hand, if you say the family is not a subject of justice, you relegate it to this realm of mystery. And a realm of mystery that may lead to people actually getting hurt. Right, um, saying that there is no justice within the family is the kind of thinking that potentially leads to the law not criminalizing marital rape. Right, saying that anything that goes on within the walls of the of the within the walls of the family home is not a matter of justice that the state can care about. It's a matter of some other kind of morality. Right, you know, someone might might say, well, of course you should not abuse other members of your family but the government should not step in and, and tell you what is abuse, uh, what is not. I mean, think of something, marital rape is one that's probably not a lot of people are going to disagree about, but think about something like corporal punishment for children. A very strong picture of uh, the family as a zone free of justice in the political sense would say, look, there's... The, Except possibly in extreme, extreme cases, the government should have no say over whether or not a certain kind of physical assault on your child is legitimate corporal punishment or, you know, abuse. Uh, and a lot of people would be, you know, some people think that's exactly what we should do, and a lot of people think that that's, that's exactly unfortunate, that we, that we should not take that view. Uh, take something, I'm going to step on the live wire here, take something like abortion. Um... In the United States, 
abortion is legally justified as a privacy right. And a lot of people take that as basically the moral justification as well, right? The, the moral argument that many supporters of abortion uh, make is, you know, keep, keep the law off my body. My body is a private zone. Now, on the one hand, this has certain kinds of advantages if you if you are are pro-choice, right? It it means the the law stays out of it. Um, on the other hand, it can potentially have disadvantages, right? If abortion is a private decision, for instance, there's no reason why the government can't say, well, okay, but we're not going to pay for it, and that's the current situation in the U.S. Thanks to the thanks to the Hyde Amendment, right? If you are on uh, Medicare or Medicaid, neither of those will pay for an abortion. So if you're poor, you're paying out of pocket. Um, there are restrictions. I forget all the details. Restrictions on if you're if you're military. Um, so there are costs and benefits to having this kind of private sphere. And a lot of folks um, uh, have argued that that no, abortion should not be considered a privacy matter, but an equal protection matter that would put it into the public sphere. Um, so yeah. So the the bottom line is that if we build our polity based on autonomy and universalizability. It may not deal properly with particularistic attachments. It may not deal properly with the family. It may not deal properly with uh, community. It may not deal properly with vulnerability. All right, let's bring this home since I have no idea how long this is yet, but it's probably way longer than what I wanted it to be. But hopefully it's it's been super exciting, right? You guys, it's been fun? No? Hello? Are you asleep? Okay. If you're asleep, wake up. We're summarizing. So, first, why should policymakers be liberal egalitarians? Well, there's a few advantages it has. There's a few things it has to recommend itself. One is that um, it makes a plausible claim to embody the concept of people as both equal and free. Utilitarianism, the argument is, gets the equality bit pretty well, but not the freedom part. Liberal egalitarianism, through its social contract model, Um, through its equal respect for people, its prioritizing of liberty, its understanding of things as the kind of things that free people could agree to at least, uh, both captures the idea that people are equal and that they are free, that they're separate individuals. It captures our deontological intuitions. Most liberal egalitarian theories end up with prioritizing liberty in some sense. Rawls explicitly does it, Dworkin explicitly does it. Uh, It captures the idea that even if it was really good for everyone, enslaving people would not be a good idea. Even if it was really good for everyone, uh, restricting free speech would would not be morally justifiable. It aims to make societal distribution of resources fair. Uh, It captures certain intuitions that a lot of people have that, uh, you know, if you if you work hard, this is the Protestant work ethic, maybe, right? But at least intuitions that a lot of Americans have, certainly, that if you work hard, you should be rewarded. And you should not be penalized for things that are outside of your control. So, you know, if you work hard, you should be rewarded even if you started poor or even if some tragedy befalls you. Um, and if you don't work hard, you should not be rewarded. Right, so it captures the intuition that if you're just born into money, uh, you shouldn't just get to do whatever you want with it. Right, it captures the 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 ambivalence with which a lot of Americans regard people like Paris Hilton or the Kardashians, who seem to have a lot of money without really doing much for it. Um, it aims to make society into something that reasonable people could agree on. That's that seems like a fairly meaningful aim. It aims to create a society where all of us could say, "Well, I don't. Things don't always go the way that I want them to, but you know, I can I can live with this kind of thing." And it tries to balance the concept of society as a cooperative project, uh, you know, where we all sort of get together to make society, uh, with the idea that society is still a group of of individuals who are ultimately responsible for themselves. So it doesn't mash us all together into one collective, but it also doesn't treat us as if we're completely separate individuals who have no impact on each other. Again, the care ethicist will say maybe this is, doesn't go far enough, but, but you know, it tries to strike a balance between those very compelling pictures of society. Why might you not want to be a liberal egalitarian? Well, there's attacks on this basically both from the left and the right. Uh, we're going to get a lot more into the, the rightward attacks next week, but uh, 
One big thing is liberal egalitarianism clearly asks you when you're creating your polity to sacrifice economic efficiency, sacrifice the amount of wealth and good things that you're able to have for greater equality and outcomes. It says we're going to restrain um, the operation of productive forces in various ways to try to ensure that things are spread out more evenly, or at least arguably does this. If you, if you think this is BS, you're probably a Marxist, let's talk. Um, it's not clear that it really respects freedom. This goes back to the hypothetical contract problem. It says that we get what idealized versions of ourselves we get out of a contract, not what we actually get out of contracts. And a lot of libertarians especially are going to, fo are going to say no. What you deserve is what you actually agree to, not what some, you know, hippy-dippy philosopher version of you would agree to. Not what some dream version of you who doesn't know anything about yourself would agree to. From the more leftward side, uh, you have these problems. It doesn't give us a lot of guidance on how to compensate for historical injustice. It has some problems with, with telling us how to do that. It doesn't have no resources, but... Um, historical injustices seem like outliers. They're bolt-on uh, to the system rather than something that it deals with directly. And it may suffer in the various ways we just talked about from assuming that this autonomous, indestructible, invincible, unencumbered individual is the moral ideal. That we should all be striving to be more like that and we should create a society that makes people able to be more like that rather than create a society that makes people able to be more caring and more connected with each other. All right, last slide, almost done. Finish your coffee. Summary, if you remember nothing else, this is the part you should remember. It's a liberal theory. Liberal egalitarianism is the first of the two main liberal theories we're gonna look at. It focuses on relations between individuals. It tries to create a distribution that is ambition sensitive, but endowment insensitive. The amount of resources you end up with in society uh, should be ones that you get more of if you work hard and make good use of your talents, but not based on anything about you that you didn't choose. It often relies on hypothetical social contract. It does so in both the Rawlsian and Dworkinian versions. It relies on the idea that what justifies the coercive power of the state is that every individual, if they were perfectly reasonable, would have agreed on the system that we have. And the system is justified in so only insofar as people would have agreed on that system. You know, so if the state tries to coerce you in ways that are um, racist, then it has no right to do so. And the political interpretation of liberal egalitarianism is usually some form of justification for redistribution. It's usually some a form of justification taken to be a justification for a form of society where you have some kind of market component, some kind of free production, consumption, allocation decision going on, uh, but then you redistribute at least part of the resources uh, from that. Whether you try to redistribute in a way that gives people better opportunities ex ante, or you try to redistribute after the fact. But um, the interpretation that a lot of people take of it may be insufficiently radical to live up to true liberal egalitarianism. Lots of people go and um, use it as support for the welfare state when it really may actually support something like democratic socialism uh, or property owning democracy the way that Rawls thinks it does. Okay, that is the end. Finally, uh, hopefully it has been at least moderately interesting. And next time we will talk about libertarianism. So if you have been waiting to hear about why Ron Paul is the savior, We'll find out next week. Have a good one.